It's my pleasure to present to you Professor Tunkai Aktosun from the University of Texas at Arlington. And today we will have a talk, a talk on inverse scattering for the half line matrix Schrodinger operator. So please, Professor. Well, it, it is my pleasure to participate uh, in the seminar series, and I thank uh, Dr. Well, and Dr. Krapetyansa, uh, and also uh, Ms. Olga uh, Pichiguna very much for inviting me to present this talk. And uh, I hope uh, everyone is able to hear me clearly and also able to see my shared screen. Now, yes. this joint work with uh, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Ricardo Vader from UNAM in Mexico City. And we started this, well, I've known uh, Professor uh, Ricardo Vader when I was a graduate student. And I think that, that so we've known each other for a long time now. And uh, so we worked on this together. So here's the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the matrix Schrodinger equation on the line, on the half line, <clears throat> and then I will mention a few relevant references just for us, and then mention a few applications, but without going into the details. And then I'm going to mention the self-adjoint boundary condition that we use, and and then mention the relevant direct and inverse scattering problems and then indicate to you the construction in the direct and inverse problems. And finally, I'm going to tell you about the characterization of the scattering data and how we address that. So here is the matrix shooting your equation on the half line. Here the prime denotes the derivative with respect to the spatial coordinate x. We have the potential, which is n by n matrix valued function and k squared or k is the spectral parameter and uh, well the wave function can be either a, an n by n matrix valued wave function or it can be just uh, one of the columns and in case we have a square integral uh, wave function that will indicate that we have a bound state at that k value. So here are the relevant references. Well, the, the references are a lot, but these are the references that prompted us. So there is the classical wor work by Agronovich and Marshenko. The English edition came in 1963, and I believe that perhaps the Russian edition was in late 1950s, where Agronovich and Marshenko did the inverse problem for the half-line Schrodinger equation, but by only using the Dirichlet boundary condition. And we were prompted by the thesis by Mark Harmer under the supervision of Professor Boris Pavlov, who died a few years ago. And then, uh, well, we part, uh, Ricardo Vader, my collaborator, participated in the in a conference celebrating the 95th birthday of uh, Professor Marchenko. In fact, uh, now I understand that there's going to be the conference repeated to celebrate Marchenko's 100th birthday in. I believe in June uh, 2022. And uh, <clears throat> well, we summarized everything in our recent research monograph. So all the results that we have can be found in this monograph that was published by Springer recently. Uh, so here are the applications of uh, uh, well, the inverse scattering <clears throat> and with the self-adjoint boundary conditions. 
So you can analyze the scattering and quantum mechanics when you have, when the particles have some internal structure. So this requires the analysis for the matrix value Schrodinger equation. Well, you can analyze quantum wires and quantum circuits. Quantum wires, perhaps as you may know, or you may have heard about this, so they, they are very thin wires where electrons flow along, and uh, so they are uh, at the nanoscale. And there are also a lot of applications in scattering on quantum graphs. Basically, you have the Schrodinger equation or other differential equations where the electrons or the scattering may be taking place on quantum graphs. So you have the edges where the, there is the flow, and then you have the vertices where you have the appropriate boundary conditions. But I'm not going to mention uh, uh, anything else about the applications. Now, how do you choose the self adjoint, the general self adjoint boundary condition at the origin in the matrix case? Well, there are various formulations of this, and we find that it is the most appropriate for us to use two matrices, two constant matrices, A and B, satisfying the two conditions. So we would like A adjoint times B to be self-adjoint, and also A adjoint times A plus B adjoint times B to be positive definite. Here I'm using the I'm not using st a star and I'm not using the asterisk, but I'm using a dagger for the matrix adjoint. You get the Dirichlet boundary condition when A, the matrix A is zero. You have the Neumann boundary condition when the matrix B is zero. And it is important that we have the general boundary condition. For example, the work by Agronovich and Marshenko involved only the Dirichlet boundary condition. Now, in this formulation, the matrices describing the boundary condition is not unique. So you can just multiply A and B by any invertible matrix T from the right, and you get the, exactly the same boundary condition. So the boundary condition is unique, but uh, the two matrices describing the boundary condition uh, are not unique, but that's fine. This is the analog of the self-adjoint boundary condition in the scalar case. So, well, you can just either use one parameter, or even if you multiply both sides by any non-zero constant, by any, say, real constant, uh, you can get the same boundary condition, even though the boundary condition is unique. But uh, the this boundary matrices don't have to be unique. And for the potential, the conditions on the potential are rather simple, and I would like the potential to be self-adjoint, and I would like the potential to be integrable, and also having the first moment. Here, this is the matrix operator norm, but you can use any other norm for the matrix. Because as you know, all matrix norms in the finite matrix case, so they are uh, just uh, equivalent. Now, when you do the analysis for large K, except for k equals zero, it is enough to have the integrability. You don't need the first moment of the potential. And, but it is important that, that you have the integrability at the origin because the so-called physical solution must satisfy the boundary condition. Now, the work by Agronovich and Marshenko does not require that the potential is integrable at the origin, but it turns out that so in the Dirichlet case, purely Dirichlet case, the physical solution 
satisfies the boundary condition at the origin under this condition, but not in the non dirichlet boundary case. So that's why uh, our work is complementary to Agronovich Marshenko, and uh, as I mentioned, with that, uh, the integrability, it is impossible to formulate the inverse problem to do the characterization. And uh, well, it is, so what we do is we put, we define the so-called input data set by bringing together the potential and the boundary condition. So the boundary condition and the potential make up the input data set. And so we name a particular input data set, we call it the FADEF class, because FADEF did a lot of work uh, in the area of inverse scattering. So if the potential is self-adjoint, and if the potential satisfies the so-called L11 condition, namely the potential is integrable and it has a first moment, we call that, and also in case we have this self-adjoint boundary condition, and uh, if we have uh, the self-adjoint boundary condition, and if we have the potential satisfying these two conditions, then we classify the corresponding input data set consisting of the potential and the boundary condition as the FADEF class of input data sets. And then uh, we would like to identify the corresponding scattering data sets. Well, the scattering data set will consist of the scattering matrix. So this is an n by n matrix valued function of the real variable k. And then uh, we have a set of positive distinct constants. So a finite number of them. And so that finite number will correspond to the so-called number of bound states. And for each bound state, we have the so-called normalization matrix, or we can call it the Marshenko normalization matrix or norming matrix. And then uh, we're going to impose some conditions on these quantities, and we call those conditions say, one, two, and three, and four, and I will explain these later on. So whenever the scattering data set consisting of the scattering matrix, the bound state information satisfy, say, four properties, then we can, we can say that our scattering data set belongs to the Marshenko class. So we name this after Vladimir Marshenko, the well-known Ukrainian mathematician uh, who's now going to be celebrating his 100th birthday next year. And uh, so here are uh, some more uh, details about the scattering data sets. So this is the bound state data and uh, the square of this quantity with a minus sign corresponds to the so-called bound state energies. And these matrices will have a rank, and that rank will be somewhere between 1 and n. So if, and that rank shows the multiplicity of each bound state. And the number of bound states is the same as the number of these eigenvalues without including the multiplicities. But if you include the multiplicities, that will correspond to the total number of bound states, including multiplicities. So again, uh, here's the reminder about the FADEF class of input data sets. Remember, we have the potential and the boundary condition, and that is that indicates the input data set, and we have the scattering matrix and the bound state information that indicates the scattering data. Now, here's the direct and inverse scattering problems. 
in the direct problem, we know the potential and we know the boundary condition. Can we determine then the corresponding scattering data? Whereas in the inverse problem, we know the scattering data. Can we recover the potential and the boundary condition? Well, both the direct problem and the inverse problem has various aspects, such as the existence, uniqueness, construction or reconstruction, and the characterization that we, we introduce and we solve. For example, the existence problem in the direct problem is if you have only, so if you start with, the, say, some input data set, does there exist a corresponding scattering data set? In the inverse problem, the existing problem is, if I come up with some scattering data set, does there exist a corresponding potential and a self-adjoint boundary condition? For example, the uniqueness in the inverse problem. Suppose I present to you a scattering data set. Well, is there only one input data set, namely, is there only one potential and only one boundary condition corresponding to you, uh, to that particular scattering data set, or are there more? And the construction or reconstruction involves the following. So you give me the input data sets consisting of the potential and the boundary condition, and I completely determine to you the corresponding scattering data set. Namely, I construct the scattering matrix, I construct the bound state information. In the inverse problem, you give me the scattering matrix and uh, the bound state information, then I construct for you the corresponding potential and I also construct the corresponding boundary condition. Now, the characterization is the most sophisticated among all these, namely, I should be able to establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two, namely, what is uh, the potential and what what is the boundary condition in such a way that uh, it will correspond, so the set will correspond to a unique scattering data set. So what are the conditions here and what are the conditions here? And in our case, it turns out that the exact conditions mostly, about simply stated is the following. If D belongs to the Fadeyev class, if S belongs to the Marshenko class, then there will be a one-to-one -one correspondence and we will have the characterization. So here are uh, the main results that we have. So this is the most important. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Marshenko class of scattering data sets and the Fadeyev class of input data sets. And then we have the construction in the direct problem. So given the Fadeyev class of input data sets, namely given the potential and given the, given the boundary condition, we construct the corresponding scattering data set that belongs to the Marshenko class. And then we also do the construction in the inverse problem. If you give us the scattering data set, then we obtain the corresponding potential and the boundary condition. And then we also show that uh, if you start with some scattering data set in the Marshenko class, then we correspond, we find, we determine, we construct the corresponding input data set in the Fadeya class, and in turn, we show that that input data set will in turn determine the same scattering data set that we started with. Equality stated, the domain of the inverse map is the Marshenko class of scattering data set, and the domain of the direct map will be the Fadeyev class of input data sets, and then we have the domain of the inverse map is the same as the range of the direct map, and it is very simple to identify the 
Fadeev class of scat, uh, Fadeev class of input data sets, and we have we present various equivalent descriptions of the Marshenko class of scattering data sets. So that in that sense, we present the characterizations, uh, the characterization statements in so many different ways, but equivalent ways. Now, here's uh, one trouble that we encounter with the traditional formulation of the inverse problem. So in the inverse problem, the Dirichlet and non Dirichlet boundary conditions are never mixed. In fact, that uh, not only they are not mixed, but they they are presented as a part of the scattering data set. Well, this is bizarre because these boundary conditions should be not a part of the scattering data sets, but it should be the input data set, namely the boundary condition and the potential should go together. So the boundary condition should not be specified along the scattering data set, but that is a traditional approach. So in our case, the boundary condition is a part of the input data set. So we're going to determine the boundary condition if we know the scattering data set. The problem arises because of the following. Now, the inverse problem for the Schrodinger equation started in mm. quantum mechanics. As you know, in quantum mechanics, well, you only use the Dirichlet boundary condition, and you normalize the scattering matrix to the identity at high energies. But it turns out that, that the, even the scattering, uh, uh, even the Schrodinger equation has a lot of applications discovered, not only quantum in quantum mechanics, but in other applications. Well, for example, I worked on the inverse problem for the vocal tract. So then you have then the Schrodinger equation with the non dirichlet boundary condition. So you should not normalize when you deal with both the dirichlet boundary condition and non dirichlet boundary condition. You should not normalize the scattering matrix to the identity matrix at high energies. Now, because of the tradition, because of this normalization, it turns out that traditionally uh, the scattering matrix is defined one way with the Dirichlet boundary condition, with another way if you have the non Dirichlet boundary condition. Well, this is a no no for us. This creates a problem, and we should define the scattering matrix the same way no matter whether we use the Dirichlet boundary condition or non Dirichlet boundary condition, or the boundary condition can be a mixture of the two, especially in applications such as quantum graphs, quantum wires. In fact, uh, let me indicate to you why it is impossible to have to formulate the inverse scattering problem in the traditional formulation by normalizing the scattering matrix to the identity at large energies. So choose the scattering matrix as a trivial case. So there's no scattering. The scattering matrix is the identity. Assume the simplest case, no bound states, and use the Dirichlet boundary condition, namely psi of zero equals zero. Then the corresponding potential is the trivial potential, zero potential. Well, then use the same scattering data, but with the Neumann boundary condition. Well, you get exactly the same potential. So as you can see, for the same potential, now you have two different scattering data sets in case you insist on including the boundary condition in your scattering data. So, so then it is impossible to have a well-posed formulation of the inverse problem. Remember, the inverse problem is you give me the scattering data set and uh, 
I determine the boundary condition and the potential. So as you can see, I cannot, so there is an ill posedness right away for one scattering data set, I have two input data sets. So the inverse problem is ill posed unless the boundary condition is a part of the scattering data in the traditional formulation. And, but to do that, you cannot mix the Dirichlet and non Dirichlet boundary condition. So you need to specify you that you either use the Dirichlet boundary condition or the Neumann boundary condition. In case you try to do the inverse problem where the boundary condition in the matrix six may be partly Dirichlet, partly and Neumann, you cannot you cannot do the inverse problem. So as a result, uh, this needs to be fixed, but unfortunately it's too late. So the proper formulation should be the following. So the scattering matrix should be this should be defined the same way whether you use the Dirichlet boundary condition or non Dirichlet boundary condition. So you cannot use two different definitions of the scattering matrix. Second, the boundary condition should not be a part of the scattering data set. It should be a part of, it should be specified along the potential. It should be the, it should belong to the input data set. And the boundary condition should be recovered from the scattering data set. Well, that is the only way to have the inverse problem to be well posed. And if you do that, then you can mix the Dirichlet and non Dirichlet boundary conditions in one in the same problem. In fact, this is needed because suppose you're doing scattering on quantum graphs. In some vertices, you may have the Dirichlet boundary condition. In some, you may have non Dirichlet boundary condition. But again, as I mentioned, if you only do quantum mechanics, you only deal with the Dirichlet boundary condition. You never deal with the non Dirichlet boundary condition. If you just do the quantum mechanics only, then it's OK to use the Dirichlet boundary condition. So here is the direct problem and the construction of the scattering data set when you start with the input data set. So remember, the input data set is the potential and the boundary condition specified, and the scattering data set is the scattering matrix and the bound state information specified. And simply stated, you start with the input data set in the so-called FADEF class, namely the potential will be self-adjoint and it will belong to the so-called L11 class. And A and B are the matrices associated with the self-adjoint boundary condition. And then the this scattering data set will belong to the Marshenko class, namely there will be four conditions or four equivalent conditions for other equivalent conditions specified. So here's the construction. So first, when in the direct problem, when you're given the potential and the you're given the self adjoint boundary condition. First, you construct the so called Yost solution. So this is the n by n matrix value solution. And to do that, you only use a potential. So you construct a solution behaving like e to the i k x at infinity. And after you you have this so called your solution f of k x and also you have the boundary matrices, you construct this matrix, which is a function of K, and that is the so-called Yost matrix. And once you have the Yost matrix, you define, you construct your scattering matrix by using the Yost matrix. And then you construct the so-called physical solution. So this is also an n by n matrix. And then, well, you continue. So now next you construct the, the 
bound state data. So you've constructed the Yost matrix. So you take the determinant, and uh, it turns out that uh, this has an analytic extension, or I should say, uh, an analytic extension to the upper half complex plane in K. So the zeros of this determinant corresponds, identifies the bound state information. So there are a finite number of them, and you obtain those. And then, knowing the Yost matrix and knowing the bound states, you construct the so-called projection matrices. And from the projection matrices, you construct the so-called normalization matrices. So you've constructed essentially everything by starting only with the potential and the self adjoint boundary condition. So you've constructed everything. And now here's the construction in the inverse problem. So now you give me the scattering matrix and the bound state information. Now I'm going to construct the potential, the corresponding potential, and the corresponding boundary condition. But if I construct these two boundary matrices, then I will certainly have the boundary condition. So given this matrix, you look at the large K asymptotics and you obtain the zeroth order and the first order matrices. And then by using the scattering matrix and by using what you've constructed, namely by, by this, so you take the Fourier transform and you obtain this quantity and by having the bound state information, you obtain this quantity. And this is called the Marshenko kernel. So then you use this constructed quantity in this integral equation known as the Marshenko integral equation. And you prove that there is a unique solution in the appropriate space and you get the solution K of XY. And then once you have K of XY, you construct the potential by putting Y equals X and then by taking the derivative. Now, now you have all these quantities at hand, and uh, then you obtain the boundary matrices A and B by solving this linear system. So the solution, you show that the solution is unique up to a post-multiplication by an invertible matrix, but that will not affect the boundary condition. So then you have also the boundary condition. Then you construct, for example, the your solution from the constructed solution to the Marshenko integral equation. And then you construct the physical solution by the quantities already constructed. And you construct the Yost matrix. And then you can verify that uh, the scattering matrix and the scattering data that you started with in the Marshenko class will give you the input data set in the Fadeev class. So you can show that the constructed potential is Hermitian, and you can show that the constructed potential is integrable and has a finite first moment. And then you can also show that the constructed boundary matrices satisfy this positive definiteness and satisfies they satisfy this uh, symmetry condition. And then you can show that the constructed physical solution will satisfy the boundary condition, and then the constructed bound states also satisfy the appropriate boundary condition. Now, uh, well, I clearly identified for you the Fadeev class of input data sets. Now, here is the identification of the Marshenko class of scattering data sets. Namely, I'm going to be imposing conditions on the scattering matrix and on these quantities and on these quantity on these matrices known as the norming matrices or normalization matrices. So 
Well, we came up with four properties and we use the Arabic letters one, two, three, four. And you'll see later on that we can replace any of these conditions by some equivalent conditions. And uh, so we can practically define the Marchenko class of scattering data sets as those quantities satisfying these four conditions. So we would like the scattering matrix to be unitary and satisfy these properties for real K values. So we would like the scattering matrix to have this large K asymptotics. And then, practically speaking, the Fourier transform of the scattering matrix uh, should be, should belong to, should be integrable when a Y is positive and should be bounded when Y is both positive and negative. And we would like the derivative of this quantity uh, to be in the L11 class, namely the matrix norm of that derivative should, should be integrable and should have the first moment. And the constructed physical solution should satisfy the boundary condition. Well, this looks a little awkward because it involves the construction, but at the same time, I will present to you equivalent conditions so that uh, you don't need to wait to check this condition. So you don't need to wait first to construct the physical solution. And then these conditions are also easy to check. So I use the bound state information and combine it with this quantity and this quantity when used as the integral kernel, the corresponding homogeneous integral equation should only have the zero solution in, well, in the class of integrable functions. So this is the definition of the Marshenko class. And if these four conditions are satisfied, as I mentioned, we had the one-to-one -one correspondence between the Fadeev class of input data sets and the Marshenko class of scattering data sets. Now, uh, well, so I continue. So as I mentioned, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Marshenko class of scattering data sets and the Fadeev class of input data sets. So whenever S, the scattering data set is in the Marshenko class, then when, uh, and also when the input data set in the FADF class, then you can start with the scattering data set and then construct the corresponding input data set and then in turn construct the corresponding scattering data set and these two will be identical. And uh, as I mentioned, it's possible to formulate four conditions on the scattering data set and it is relatively easy to remember what the Fadeev class of input data sets. The potential should be self-adjoint and should belong to the L11 class. By the way, the L11 class is informally known also as the Fadeev class. So that's why we chose this name. And also, as a part of the input data set, we have the boundary condition determined by these two boundary matrices satisfying the self-adjointness and the positive definites. And as I mentioned, it is possible to replace these conditions. It's possible to reformulate these conditions in equivalent statements, so, which we can call one star, two star, three star, four star. So, well, uh, again, the characterization takes place if you have S in the Marshenko class, D in the Fadeev class. So, and the definition of the Marshenko class is S should satisfy these four conditions. Now, we can replace, for example, the condition three by two equivalent statements that we use the Roman uh, and numbers. Or, for example, you can 
replace, say, these two conditions, three and four, by equivalent conditions. Or you can replace, for example, the Arabic condition, Arabic numeral condition one with the two conditions. And then uh, you can have two other equivalent conditions. In fact, uh, it turns out that condition three can be stated at least in two different ways. Condition four can be stated in five different ways. This condition can be stated in three different ways. And uh, this condition can be stated in eight different ways. So there are all these equivalent formulations. And for example, just to give you, so this condition says, oh, the derivative of this quantity that you obtain from this practically corresponds the, to the Fourier transform on the S matrix. So you, as you can see, there is some conditions or for example, this condition says, oh, there are precisely this many linear independent solutions to this homogeneous version of the Marshenko integral equation, but when you use the kernel without using the bound state information. So, well, for example, it's possible to formulate the conditions, the characterization conditions, by using the so-called Levinson's theorem. So, well, the condition is the scattering matrix should be continuous, and uh, well, the change in the argument of the determinant in the scattering matrix should be related to the number of bound states. Well, well, you also have such equivalent conditions. As I mentioned, all these conditions can be stated in appropriate equivalent ways. Now, I'm going to finish my talk by presenting to you some examples. And uh, we have more examples in the research monograph that we have. In these examples, we present some scattering data sets where either all the conditions are satisfied or only one condition is violated, but other conditions are satisfied. So here I'm just giving you a few samples. For example, in the scalar case, suppose you take your scattering matrix this way and suppose there are no bound states. Well, it turns out that the scattering data set belongs to the Marshenko class. So you can do the construction and you can construct the corresponding potential and co corresponding boundary condition. In fact, this potential resembles the uh, soliton potential, but uh, here the construction is certainly on the half line. So you cannot have a soliton on the half line, so, but it is a part of the soliton-like potential. And it turns out that the boundary condition here is A is identity zero, so this corresponds to, and B is arbitrary, not zero constant, namely the Neumann boundary condition. For example, let's take a look at the, this scattering data set, and this is not in the Marchenko class. Only one condition is violated, namely the first condition. And uh, so this condition th is not satisfied. So the scattering matrix is not unitary here. So as a result, uh, uh, for example, you can also look at other conditions. For example, in Levinson's theorem, you get the number of bound states as a half integer, but that cannot happen. So all these different conditions will help you to check various aspects uh, and tell you whether you have uh, the scattering matrix belonging to the appropriate class or not. So, for example, let's take a look at another example. So here I have this I, because of this, uh, this scattering data set does not belong to the Marshenko class. So only one condition is not satisfied. And while well, the effect is here, it turns out that uh, if you insist to use this, then you're going to get A and B both should be equal to zero. 
then this condition will be violated. And uh, for example, let's take a look at this. So here you get the, you construct, if you insist on using this, this does not belong to the Marsenko class. Then you see that at x equals zero, the potential is not integrable. In fact, the potential behaves like one over x squared. Not only not integrable, but also the first moment does not exist. So you have a lot of trouble here. And uh, so here's uh, another example. So this does not belong to the Marshenko class. And so only one condition is not satisfied. And if you try to, if you insist on using this as your scattering data, it turns out that uh, the constructed physical solution will not satisfy the boundary condition. Or if you use an equivalent formulation of the characterization related to Levinson's theorem, then the number of bound states in total will be a negative number, but you cannot have a negative number for the number of bound states. So, and here's my last example and last slide. Uh, this scattering data set belongs to the Marshenko class. Here, I'm in the two by two case. So if you use this as your scattering matrix, and if you have one bound state of multiplicity two, and if you use this as your Marshenko norming constant, in fact, you can see that the, the rank of this matrix is two, multiplicity is the same. So this is an invertible matrix. Then everything will go through and you will be able to construct your input data set in the Fadeev class. So here's the constructed potential and then you're able to construct the corresponding boundary matrices. Well, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, this is the last slide that I have. And uh, so I hope I, I finished my presentation on time. In fact, I perhaps three minutes early and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much for, for a very interesting talk. Thank you. So please, if there are questions. And I should also mention that I, I've sent uh, by email the PDF file of my presentation uh, to the organizers. And so either they can make it available to everyone at their web page, or in case anybody is interested in, the, I will be happy to send the, the presentation slides uh, as a PDF file by email. Perfect. The PDF file of your presentation will be uploaded on the web page site uh, of, of this seminar. So it will be there. Thank you. There is a question. By Alexander Smirnov, please go ahead. Uh, can you uh, tell me if your constructions can be extended to uh, the case when we have a singular endpoint at zero? For example, in in one of your slides, uh, you showed. Uh, the example uh, where some uh, scattering matrix corresponds to one over R square potential. Uh, yes. ca 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 can be some extension of uh, your constructions that include such cases. Right. So, well, In fact, uh, th this is the case which was considered by Agranovich and, and Marchenko yeah, in, in their book. Yeah, yes. Uh, so, uh, in, in the book by Agranovich and Marchenko, they consider that singular case. Well, uh, we cannot do the characterization in this case, mainly, uh, we, we cannot tell what the scattering data, 
what class the scattering data set will belong to so that uh, the corresponding potential will have the singularity. And uh, uh, so we can certainly use the Marshenko method to obtain such potentials, but we cannot do the characterization because that is outside the... Uh, so, so in that sense, for singular potentials with this type of singularity, I guess Marshenko's work uh, perhaps is the only work, but but at the same time, uh, uh, I mean, we, we don't have the characterization in that case. But uh, uh, in fact, I believe uh, uh, with my collaborator, uh, Ricardo Vader, we were planning to work on that case sometime in the future. Uh, Ricardo, would you have any comments on this? Ricardo, uh, your microphone. Yes, uh, it's on. Uh, well, <clears throat> the issue is the following. Now, if you happen to know that the singularity is specifically of that form, well, then you can do things, right? Um, uh, yes, in general, yes, yes. well, if you do non-Dirichlet boundary condition, you could not define the boundary conditions by matrices. You will need to use um, limits of Bronskians, right? Because it's not locally integrable. Y yes, so, of course. I, I, I meant uh, precisely that, that maybe your construction can be extended to boundary conditions specified by, by Bronskians. Yes, this is certainly possible, and this is uh, something that we have in mind. If you specify boundary conditions by Bronskians, uh, then then you can consider that type of singularity. But this uh, this method will have to be changed, right? Now, uh, as in a Granovian marching con, if you happen to know precisely which singularity you have, let's say in the scalar case, uh, if you have, say, um, uh, the standard radial Schrodinger equation, you know is 1 over r squared, then you can solve in terms of uh, special functions uh, and so on, Bessel mm -hmm. functions. So in mm -hmm. that case, it is possible. Also for the long-range behavior, if you wish to go uh, beyond the short-range case, if it is a background type situation where you know the long range behavior is part of your data, then you can reconstruct a short range perturbation, say. So there are some possibilities to extend. But uh, I believe the main issues are already here. Mm -hmm. So you will need to adjust it. For example, uh, local singularities at zero would require Bronskians. Long-range behavior would require that you are in a so-called background situation. Uh, and then the related ideas would work, right? With some changes, uh, but we have that in mind. But I, I, as I mentioned, I believe the basic issues are already in this case. Yes, yeah, so for the general knowledge, Agnorovich and Marshenko separate this particular singularity, which is known, and then try to do the inverse scattering for the remaining part of the potential, yeah. Yeah. basically by assuming that this is known and the regular part of the potential is viewed as a perturbation on this part. Mm -hmm. So I think Thank that you. is the context in which you can generalize. But perhaps in, in particular cases, as they do, right? There are many applications in nuclear physics of this type of, of problems. And in some cases, they do have single potentials and so on. But I, I think this should be done case by case. Because yeah, yes. in the particular type of singularity you have, then the solution, then the problem will be different, right? So as a general theory, I think, this is the general theory. Then particular cases, singularities and long range should be treated one by one. Yes, even in the scalar case, I guess if this number is 
L times L plus one, where L is an integer, the treatment is relatively easy. But in case this is not L times L plus one, where L is an angular momentum number, I guess the treatment is more difficult. Okay, thank you. So thank please, you. if there are more questions. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, uh, in your you uh, in in the general scheme of construction of um, scattering matrix, uh, you use just a functional approach, and the, the standard approach, uh, such as in Reed Simon, for example, to scattering theory is uh, to construct uh, Mueller matrices and uh, using them uh, scattering matrix and then scattering matrix is uh, uh, decomposed in direct integral and uh, we obtain uh, matrices that you denote S of K. Uh, uh, um, my question is whether this way can be, uh, wh whether you can go this way in this case, under your conditions. Okay. So, well, I guess the, if I paraphrase the question, so uh, the, the question is the following. We have the, so we're using the scattering data set consisting of the scattering matrix and the bound state information. Well, mm -hmm. Certainly, it is possible to have equivalent scattering data set, not necessarily in terms of the scattering matrix and the bound state information, but all this information may be contained in some other format. Uh, so, uh, I guess uh, one possibility is to transform, to, to find a one-to-one -one connection between this formulation of the scattering data, and then uh, the formulation in the Hilbert space. Uh, yeah, yes, in the appropriate language used by uh, Barry Simon and other groups. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, well, I, I assume it is possible to do all this. Uh, so we basically followed uh, the scattering data set used by quantum by physicists, by uh, people who do quantum scattering. Uh, but certainly, uh, it should be possible to find a connection. Find a connection. Uh, so find the, translate the scattering data set in the appropriate language and formulate it in some other way. Uh, for example, one possibility is the following. Here, this is the Marshenko approach. As you know, there is also the so-called delphine leviton approach. So in that approach, you don't use the scattering matrix, but you use the spectral measure. Uh, so by using mm -hmm. the spectral measure, then you construct the both the boundary condition and the potential. So yes, oh, 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 oh. Uh, oh, no. see the uh, uh, the comment, perhaps. Hello? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, with regard to the, say, the Mueller wave operators and the scattering operator and the connection between the, the scattering operator and the scattering metrics defined by direct integral, and the scattering metrics as defined here in this talk, well, we do that in our monograph. There is a chapter in our monograph where we do the wave operator theory, we define the scatter operator, and we, the, we uh, prove the equivalence with this, with this scattering metrics defined in terms of the JOS metrics. So that, that you will find in our monograph. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, here, so this is our monograph. Perhaps I can make it a little larger. Uh, 
also, uh, as Ricardo mentioned, we have <laughs> so, Ricardo, uh, are you able to point out to the exact place? Yes, uh, well, it is in the next chapter. Yeah, you mm -hmm. see, if you make it bigger, because I don't mind it. So, there, there the, the scattering theory uh, defined by the wave operators. Yes. Right. Here. So uh, focus. Uh, well, it's not focused, Jay. So now, yes. now you have <laughs> direct scattering two chapter. There you find all that information. Okay. Uh, Th thank you. Thank you. And there are also results in the spectral sheath function, in the uh, bounds, in the number bound state, and so uh, a scattering theory done in Hilbert space. You find in that chapter two. The trace formulas uh, as well. Uh, so there you can see a spectral sheet function, trace formula, and then bounds in the number of bound state and so on. So that was considered, yes. Thank you. May I ask a small question regarding your last slide, last example? Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, the matrix A is not uh, recovered uniquely. Ye yes. Is it? Yes. Is it? So. Uh, well, so. that is not a problem at all, uh, because if you look at the, even though A and B are not unique, and they are, they can only be defined up to a multiplication, post-multiplication by an invertible matrix. But if you look at the boundary condition, so here's the boundary condition. Mm -hmm. You can multiply the boundary condition from the left by any invertible matrix without changing the boundary condition. So this is equivalent to using the boundary condition in this case. Here, for example, you can make the boundary condition uniquely determined by a parameter, but at the same time, you can multiply both sides by any non-zero constant, you're gonna get the same boundary condition. So it is possible to, instead of using A and B, you can just use an equivalent unitary matrix here to get something unique. We found that the formulation of the boundary condition the most appropriate in this form because this gives you the flexibility of the so-called constructing the regular solution satisfying the initial condition equal to A, the derivative of the regular solution equal to B. So this freedom gives us uh, more flexibility without really affecting the boundary condition. So again, even though we have this flexibility in choosing A and B, but the boundary condition is not affected. The boundary condition is unique, even though we have this freedom in okay. the choosing other boundary matrices. Okay, uh, thank you. Let me, let me have a comment. The fact that the boundary matrices are not unique, uh, it's actually uh, very good from the point of view of the applications, because these matrices contain physical parameters. Uh, and that means that you can, you, you can adjust your problem uh, by changing the boundary matrices to fit the parameters that you have in the, in the applications in the particular problems. Uh, for example, uh, we prove in our monograph that up to some transformation, the most general boundary condition uh, gives you a problem which is unitary equivalent, uh, where you have a number of Dirichlet and a number of non-Dirichlet boundary conditions. For example, uh, if you are in the two by two case, and you have the 
Kirk cross boundary condition. Uh, after this transformation, what you get is one Dirichlet and one Neumann. But one Dirichlet and one Neumann will not fit the physics of the problem, right? Whereas Kirchhoff boundary condition will give you the continuity of the solution and the sum of derivative being equal to zero. And this is what you wish in the application. Uh, also, technically, it's very useful to have this flexibility to go to this diagonal form when you have Dirichlet and non Dirichlet. And so the, we, we view this uh, non uniqueness uh, as something very helpful. Okay, I see. Not really a problem. Right? Okay, thank you. If there are other questions, If not, then thank you very much again. So thank you. Thank you very interesting talk and discussion.